Yeah, you're very welcome back to Tuesday Nights Off the Ball. Richie McCormick here with you right through until 10pm tonight. It is All Ireland Final Sunday coming up this Sunday, but would you believe it's almost been four weeks since that incredible tussle in the quarterfinals between the All Ireland finalists Galway and Armagh. One of the stars of Armagh's year this year, and indeed the previous year has gone by too, has been Rory Grugan. I'm delighted to say Rory joins us on the line this evening. Good evening to you, Rory. How's it going, Richie? Rory, I tell you what, it seems like we're still on some level kind of uh, letting the dust settle on that game between yourselves and Galway, even though we're facing into an All Ireland final, even though Galway have already had an outing against against Derry. Do you still feel that there's some level of decompression going on for yourselves after that, or is it all now water under the bridge? Oh, I don't know if it's quite water under the bridge yet. Um, definitely a bit of decompression still happening. Um, I suppose. You get back into the club stuff, you know, which is which is always good just to to clear the head and to refocus on something else. Uh, but we actually had about a week or ten days off there from everything, which you don't get too often. So it was nice just to get away for a few days and try and clear the head, you know, before getting stuck back in now and ready for a club championship. It just didn't seem like a regular championship defeat or a championship exit or an end to a to an inter county season for for Armagh because it was <clears throat> just so extraordinary, pretty much on every level, and the ramifications of it kept murmuring and murmuring afterwards. Um, First of all, like, do you feel like you left that one behind you to a degree? Do you feel the sense of regret over that particular day and in terms of maybe how you set forth, particularly in the first half, or is it just a matter of, of confluence of kind of factors? Uh, probably a few different things, but I would definitely say um, that Galway were the better team on the day. Um, now, in saying that, we did put ourselves in a position to win at the very end of extra time. And, and when you've been in that scenario, and then go through the penalties and on all the drama that surrounds that. Uh, it does feel a bit like you left it behind, but like if we're being honest with ourselves, you'd have to say that Galway played the better football. We would be quite disappointed with our performance um, outside of maybe the first 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, we feel like we, did, we didn't deliver on, on what we're capable of. So I suppose there's that feeling of regret as such, but also then the, 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 you're probably a bit proud of the way we hung on and kept fighting back and we're actually in then in a position to win. So it's a bit of double whammy. You know, you didn't play well and you're still in a position uh, to win it and still haven't come out on the right side of it. So it's one that it'll definitely take a while to get over. Is it like, <clears throat> pardon me for my ignorance here, is it, after an exit like that, people kind of think that teams maybe might go their own separate ways almost straight afterwards. Was there a kind of a, an analysis of the game afterwards as among the squad uh, with Kieran heading it or was it a case of you went back and looked at it yourself? It usually is the way after that people go back and look at it themselves and you know maybe at some stage down the line you then go and do that when it's not as raw or whatever uh, and look at it in the cold light of day in terms of actual analysis but you know boys just tend to stay together in the day or two after and then you know it just it just depends like it, it, you go from spending so much time with each other and, and all focus towards this one goal to you know, coming off the other edge of it, and you you do sort of be looking out and, and looking to meet up with boys again, just uh, because that's just I suppose the relationship that you build as part of a county team. Um, but like I say, I think with 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 time and a bit of reflection, you can actually analyse it better uh, as opposed to um, looking at it immediately, where where the hurts maybe more raw. How do you bring it up in those kind of conversations? Like, is it just a case of how are you how are you getting on? how do you launch into the conversation about the game and I'd imagine it can be a little bit tentative a little bit awkward perhaps to maybe get into the meat and potatoes of it with with your fellow teammates afterwards yeah well the thing is it's probably easier with them than anyone else because they experienced it too so you know there's no like cliches or, or no beating around the bush like you can just be honest with each other and you know we all know ourselves where it went wrong like we train to perform a certain way in terms of principles and all, all that type of stuff like you know targets around uh, tactics and all that so we had a fair idea where it went wrong so at least you can just chat through that you know honestly together mm. and it isn't it isn't a case of like getting into the real nitty gritty so soon after and when you know that the year is over like it just doesn't seem that there's much of a point to that 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 type of thing would actually be more productive leading into the following season is usually the way it goes. Yeah, it's it's difficult to look back on, I'd imagine, once you've had that kind of defeat and the manner of it, etc. But would you regard this year as a whole as a success for Arma? Um, Probably bits and pieces, but ultimately not really where we wanted to go. Um, we had a decent league campaign. like We obviously got a really good start with the first two results and then probably... Uh, 
lost him at be a bit of form for a couple of games and then recovered to finish fairly well. So the league campaign in itself, I suppose, for us in Division One last year was a, a strange year with the mini league, the COVID league. So mm. it was proper consolidation of our Division One status. So that in, in itself, I suppose, is a good first step towards um being at that top level all the time. And then like there's no getting away from the fact that we were extremely disappointed with our Donegal performance and it's well documented at this stage, you know, how much that sort of hurt us and the work we then put in to try and correct that. And I suppose there was a good buzz maybe for a couple of weeks um, with the two results against Tyrone and Donegal. But like, you know what it's like for players at this level, you know, ultimately you want to go on and succeed even further. And like, I know there's been plaudits and stuff about the game and, you know, I know our supporters and stuff would be proud of how we've done, but we would see it as wanting something more than that. Mm. But that's, that's just the nature of it, I think. When you sat down before, say, the McKenna Cope games this year, before that first game in the league against Dublin, was there like a goal set forth? Like, I'm not, I know, like, talking to, or when we were talking about the, the rugby there the other day, there was that Andy Farrell quote where he sat all the, the, the squad down before the trip to New Zealand and said, do you believe we can win a series? Was there, like, a particular goal in mind uh, between yourself and the management team this year or was it a case of game by game we'll see where where this goes because we know certainly what the ability of this squad is well it's probably again a mixture because you can set your goal for the, the two parts of the season with like the league or almost three parts of the league also championship and then Ireland series so mm. like it, it is generally the first protocol to, to get safe in Division 1 and I suppose uh, now it's it's just a case of the top two going to a final so we were in a good position from the start, so like we probably reassessed it and said, like, why not go for it? And I think it was the carry result that day, maybe that ended it, even though maybe other results might have worked, like with that last Donegal game. Um, we so that is a goal in itself mid season, and then like there's no doubting about it. Like anyone now in the Ulster Championship, like goes to look at it and says, uh, why not us? It, it's an extremely competitive championship, and we we known being in Division 1 against uh, three other Ulster teams and Derry coming strong, that it was going to be massively competitive, but we thought that we had as good a chance as anyone to go and win it. So it was d- disappointing to leave that one behind, probably. Yeah, it's like, when you think of Ulster teams, particularly in Division 1, like Ulster is generally regarded, and I think with some degree of merit, as being the most difficult championship in terms of football. Just given how competitive it is, there's a lot of teams in and around the same level. Year on year, it's going to produce some epics, and then you're obviously competing in Division One. Like that's a lot of really top level games for you to be playing week in and week out. Probably from from what the middle of February is when the league started in and around. Like that's a it's an awful lot to ask of not just yourselves, like any Ulster team who are, who are operating in and around Division One and Two. It seems to be other teams in other parts of the country maybe have more of an opportunity to to feel their way into seasons a little bit more. Yeah, maybe like maybe there's a bit of familiarity breeds content. Like even the two draws we got in the qualifiers this year were again two more Ulster games. But at the end of the day, you probably have about what is it, three McKenna Cup games, seven guaranteed league games, and only actually two guaranteed Tamsu games. You know, you obviously want more than that. So like there aren't that many games in a season. And like there's a lot of training and preparation that goes into it. So when players get to the level, like we worked very hard to get to Division 1, like over the course of five, six, seven years now, and you want to be at that level and you want to test yourself against those teams. So I understand your point to an extent that it's a wee bit maybe looking right when others maybe aren't doing it exactly the same as the Ulster teams have to, but there's kind of the other side of you goes, well, that's where you wanted to be. So you can't have your cake and eat it. You know, Mm -hmm. this is the level you want to be at. And I've known from coming from a level where we would have played in Division 3 and that, that it is the big step up and the improvement that probably we've seen in the last uh, year or so is due to being able to play at that top level. Was there a sense within the squad after those first two results in the league that this was a team on the move? Like There was a, there was a buzz around the country about Armagh and the possibilities for yourselves you know, in the latter stages of the year because of those two results against Dublin and against Tyrone that maybe this is a team who, you know, after a long time of kind of being away from the dance, we're finally back to looking like that team of of uh, the McGinnies and McConvilles of this world, that they could compete and be at that level again. Did that kind of stuff seep into the squad? Uh, was there a sense that, you know, maybe we do have an opportunity to do something special this year? I wouldn't like to think so, because I suppose you're always trying to guard against that, t- that type of um, mindset, because it's the thing that'll catch you. But 
Um, like there's no doubt with the crowds and stuff that there were that time that, that the Tyrone game and the Flatter Grounds the second week, like it was just a bit of a throwback, you know, in terms of the atmosphere and, and the kind of maybe the tension and stuff in the game. Like it probably uh, led into the hype to an extent, but as players, we knew that like that really meant nothing so earlier in the year in terms of later in the year, the ultimate goal. Like it, it, to, it shows you that you can go to Croke Park and compete and you can play against the Iron Champions and the same thing, compete with them. But it doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean that the end result's going to be there either. So mm. it was good in a way because, like, I think the whole thing of crowd being away for a couple of years and everything has, like, starved a lot of supporters, but it seems to have starved our mass supporters more than any because they've really like, got on board with it this year. And they always did. Like, there was always a real core there, but it seems to have really built... And probably just around maybe the, the bit of promise that they felt that, that is there with the team at the minute. And certainly hasn't gone away, I don't think, after the, the, the quarterfinal loss to go. There is a sense that, you know, Armagh can most definitely use these experiences from this year as a platform into next after, you know, maintaining your status there in Division 1 and given the platform that you've given yourselves to really put fear into other sides in Ulster. That there is a sense that, do you, do you appreciate that now that this could be a step to support something more or is it still raw uh, in terms of the exit to Galway? Well, I suppose it'll only be in hindsight that I'll say it was a nice stepping stone. Um, mm. Like, we know that competing at the top level is where you need to get to. Like, there probably aren't many teams who have just, like, jumped up and in their first season in Division 1, went on to ultimate success in the championship. And, like, you, you never wanted to be the stepping stone. You always want that year to be the year. But you maybe look back on it and say, right, well, these are just the kind of the right of passage that you have to go through. Like, no one wants that, but I suppose it's only on reflection. And you like to think that there, there's promise there, that there's a, a brilliant management setup, a brilliant, like, you know, squad that's there in terms of the depth. Like, we played a good part of a chunk of our championship without four or five really excellent players who, like, all been well, will we'll come back and add the thing next year. Um, and, a, and a quite a good age profile in that so like, you would like to think that uh, that we can build on it and, and keep the whole thing going Have you kind of settled into your role as one of the elder statesmen in that squad now without wanting to put <laughs> years on you because like, because, like you mentioned it has refreshed brilliantly like it, and naturally over over the course of the last three four years especially but you're now yeah. north of 30 uh, yeah. without wanting to, to dob you in and anything like that but you know you're, you get to be one of the, the go-to guys now yeah, well, um, it was one of the games earlier in the year in the league, and it was actually, I think it was my wife said to me after, did you realise you were the oldest player in the pits there for Armagh? And I said, thanks very much, Flat. I didn't actually realise that. So, um, yeah, that like you say, it is just um, kind of been that way, where there's kind of a group around my age, around 31, 32, like maybe four or five of us who've kind of been that core of a team, uh, you know, who played in Division 3, like I said, back in, back in 2016, 17. And then there's been a really good sort of bunch of younger ones have come in behind that and have added sort of serious quality and depth, I think, to what we have. So uh, just sort of out of nowhere. Um, people always tell you when you're younger that uh, it goes by in a flash, so, so don't miss it. But now I can see they were right. You kind of, yeah. It, it, and it's that it's at that point where you kind of turn around and go, you, you suddenly have 10 years in the rearview mirror. And it, like, it becomes, like, does, does that add a sharpness of intensity as to regards what you want to end up taking from your time with Armagh or is it the conversely does it make you more relaxed because you are more experienced um, it probably does sharpen the mind because like even the likes of the Ulster Championships and stuff like you know it's it's well known that we haven't had a good record in the Provincial Championship and you know the last team to win one was in 2008 and you know, it just feels like it can go by in a flash. And even with the new structures and stuff that are coming into place, you just wonder what that'll all mean for it down the line for whatever years are left sort of for myself. So it does sharpen the mind a wee bit, but then like you you realise that that experience stands there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that like, you know, you should, hope, you should hope that you could be one of the leaders in the team and, and use that for younger players and stuff and that might lean on you for a bit of advice here and there. So it's probably double-edged. Speaking like as regards like leaning on, on, on experience, uh, what's it been like as, as been one of those forwards to kind of tap into what Kieran Donaghy has, has brought into the, the scenario there up, up in Armagh? Because that level of experience, that well of knowledge, like that's got to be a great resource for, for players like yourself to kind of tap into. Let's give us a bit of an insight, or an insight into, into what Donaghy's like around that training camp. 
Yeah, he's been he's been brilliant uh, since he's come in, uh, um, and just obviously about two years ago or so when when he first joined us, and probably just a different perspective. Like coming from Kerry, he maybe looks at things a bit differently than we do in terms of you know how you carry yourself and stuff and the way you think and even in terms of forwards you know his stuff would have been big like everyone knows the type of player that Kieran was he was unselfish he made other people look good you know he was always with the team rather than himself so like it probably would have been a bit of a thing about Arma have had good forwards and stuff like this here and we maybe weren't delivering on it so I suppose his big thing was always been that you you want to make other people look good and that is something that Kieran McGinney, like has said since the day dot since he came back, that it's always been making others look good. And I suppose even the likes of like probably Kieran Donnie's getting a lot of plaudits in this. All the Kieran's as well. Kieran McKeever, like has had a serious impact. The two of them have come in at the same time. Um as long as even Kieran McKinney goalkeeping coach. So I think somebody said after the match that you're you're not allowed into the management squad unless your your name is Kieran. But uh like I say, you know, it it takes an army and there's no doubt that Kieran Donaghy, you know, his positivity, his influence around that type of thing, and like his lack of, or his his stuff around, um, like his basketball knowledge all around the kickout stuff and all, you know, has been brilliant. And I've loved learning off him, and, and, I, and I hope I continue to do so. Did he kind of have any influence in you know how you approach the game in terms of? Especially like your the, the the best use of a goalkeeper that I've seen uh, with Ethan Rafferty. Like, th- does he did he play into kind of the process of of him going back a, as a goalkeeper and how you might use him? Was that a purely geezer move, or you know, was it just Ethan putting his hand up and saying, "I can play keeper"? Uh, I pro- I don't know the inner workings behind the scenes, like, um, but what I do know for sure is that like geezer is an innovator in terms of the way he thinks about the game and I think he's been way ahead of it for a while but it has maybe just come to fruition this year and has naturally ended up that Ethan has like the athleticism and you know just all those parts of his game that have lent itself well to you know the role he's kind of played this year and I'd say between all of them you know it was something that came to but I know I know where the idea started anyway. Yeah, because it seems like you know forwards are the ones who kind of tend to profit from those kind of innovations because someone like him it, it allows you to get quick ball, it possibly quicker than you would have anticipated with a quote unquote traditional goalkeeper. Yeah, and I suppose the big thing initially, the likes of of Bagan and Morgan, like who would have you know introduced this thing of coming out as the extra man and get you past the press, and especially like Niall, his long distance uh, kick pass and stuff is a real feature, and that's something that Ethan has in his locker too, and. It does allow you to get that long ball, you know, every now and again. But uh, as well as that, like he's actually a scoring threat, like uh, as you've seen now. Um, and it just shows the way the game has evolved. Like, you know, initially it gets you out past the thing. And then somebody who's probably as athletic as Ethan and talented in terms of his long range shooting and passing, it, it's an extra weapon that that he's, uh, we've been able to use and he's really he's really grown into it. Yeah, it's like it's a tactically evolving thing and also it's like a simple thing. When you look back on that goal you scored in the league against Tony Gall, like it, football can be a remarkably simple thing where it can be like one, two balls straight down to the big forward, catches, turns, scores. And similarly, that seems to be where you profited, especially in the quarterfinal against Gall is when you really tried to test their keeper and... and yeah, like that seems like a, a very Donaghy move uh, more than it would be a McGinney move. Well, it's probably a case of like no one when to mix it. So like there's opportunities to do that and there's probably people having the sense to to see it's the two on two or the three on three or you know, that's the time to try it because like most teams now are clued in how to uh, be set up defensively and stuff. So you get sort of opportunities to do it. Like we talked about it for the throw in and stuff. I know people are analysing some of those from us and then it's the same with these these types of passes. But like to be fair as well, there was probably an element of we, we were six points down, you know, maybe already in the stoppage time when those balls were going in. And sometimes it can just be a case of, of playing the percentages and seeing what comes from it. But mm. uh, there's definitely a bit of design behind it as well. Like it, it is a skill and that's something that Kieran Donny would be big on. The those type of passes and that there is a real skill to the where you're looking to 
aim them and how you get off them and all the rest and it's definitely something we could do a lot better Given the profit that came from them is there a sense of regret that you didn't turn towards that tactic a little bit sooner against Galway? Um, possibly but again like we haven't gone through that I, I don't know mm. um, maybe that's the case that, that others would feel that way but uh, like that would be a more of a hindsight thing I, I think just, just the way it ended up That's fair Um the other thing, the other main, I guess, talking point that came out of that game was was the stuff that went on just after the halftime whistle blew and the mass uh, melee, we'll call it brawl, whatever you want to call it, and, and Tiernan Kelly's then uh, intervention on, on Damien Comer. Uh, what was your, uh, I guess, uh, sight on all that? How, how in the middle of it were you all at that stage? And and what was your thinking of, of what was occurring on the pitch at the time? Um, well, I suppose in all the excitement of um, the final whistle going you know, it probably could have been done better that the, the two teams were going in at a different time. And like my role on it was fairly on the outskirts, as, as uh, some will know. But like, I think it's been made fairly clear at this stage and everyone knows that um, Tiern like, will have regretted what happened. And, you know, we don't want to, to see that type of stuff, especially on the bigger stage. But it's just it's hard not to feel um, a bit frustrated with the maybe the extent of the coverage and the, it felt a bit targeted. Like and again, who knows that that could just be my opinion on it. Um, but it's it was regrettable. But I just think we could have dealt with it better um, on a bigger level, uh, both moving forward in terms of the the procedures around those times in the game and also maybe just people being more aware of, of like the work, the things they're saying and posting, whether that's in a position of responsibility, which plenty of those people were doing it, or people with less responsibility, which is, is hard to control until when it comes to the social media side of things. People might say that, you know, this is what the, the third, I think, such incident that Armagh were involved in. Do you, do you, you know, I don't, I'd imagine you dispute this, but do you think that there's a bit of reputation around the panel at the moment and as regards their their physicality and their you know willingness or otherwise to get involved in these kind of situations uh, I'd say there probably is something there in terms of the opinion from outside of it but you'd hardly be surprised to know that we might have a different opinion on it on how some of those things originated and like it's no I'm not going to get into it now to be honest with you a lot of it's gone now and I suppose mm-hmm. our, our season is over and I don't want to, to drag that stuff up but I just hope moving forward that people can actually look closely at what is happening um, and then, you know, make up their own minds on it. Like like I said, it's, it wouldn't be the way I play the game and stuff anyway. So, But I just mean, I think the, the perception is not a reality, let's say. Okay. As regards the actual culmination of the game, where do you stand on... Penalties is probably the sharp end at this point because I guess the, the the bigger question is whether or not you know it's right to have the championship championship matches like this ended in such a fashion as regards it needs to end this week because there's another one coming down the line so quick. Does this split season um, experiment at the moment as it is, does it need a bit of tinkering as regards stretching not only the football season but we've heard complaints from the hurling season needs to be stretched out as well in the wake of the All-Ireland final. Would you have been happier if things had been a little bit more elongated this summer for obviously in terms of the amount of games that you want to play, but obviously in, in, in the in terms of the timetable as well? Um the probably the first part, the penalties, like again, maybe we wouldn't have uh you wouldn't have been saying that. Like so, you know, people have been coming up to you and saying, Oh, it shouldn't have been penalties, it should have been a replay and you're sort of thinking like if we had if we had won in penalties, would you still be saying the same thing? Now, to be fair to Park Choice, he came out and said that he felt sorry for the team and management and that he doesn't believe that that's the way the game should be ended. And it kind of does split opinion. Um, even we like are running a, a summer camp thing here and kids in the camp, like you could get an argument going that would last all day about whether it should happen or not. But the the thing about the split season is, is it for the many or the few? And I know that there's a an element to it of promotion of the top end of the games and making sure that they are seen by the biggest audience and, and celebrated. But there's also a, has to be a recognition of the 99%. And like all of inter players are also club players. And I know that 
anyone I've spoken to as a player massively appreciates the, the definite schedule of your club season, like in terms of the championship, is going to run from here to here. So you can, you know, arrange things that you've never been able to really do in the past. Mm-hmm. And even for inter-county players, like, um, I know the, the traditional thing about September or even in August with the, the final, the, um, the All-Ireland final, knowing that it was at the third week in July means the same thing, that you can hope for the best case scenario that you're in it and then, you know, allow yourself some time of downtime or whether that's a holiday or getting away with family or something. Uh, before you then reset and get back in your club because um, I think maybe the people now you're saying that the experience possibly not working is it isn't coming from a player's perspective so maybe whatever time I'm done I might look back and say oh yeah it's time to go back to the old way but at the minute I've got my players hat on and I, and I do believe that it is worth persevering with maybe like if it was a week or two but what dis- difference does that really make you know are we going to put them are we going to say, right, we can stop, we can finish an Ulster final by penalties, but we can't finish an Ireland quarter final because we, we have to, we, they deserve a replay. You know, at that stage, like, where, where's the drawback or where's the, where's the end line with it? Because everyone will argue, right, well, we should do it for this game and this game and this game until then you've replays the whole time or, you know, it isn't finished on the day. Hmm. So it is a hard, it is a hard one to solve. And you're, like, you're a teacher as well, aren't you? I am, yeah. Yeah, so that means like if you go by the old calendar deep into the summer, you essentially don't have a summer. And a lot of people will go, oh, boo hoo, teachers get enough holidays anyway, et cetera, et cetera. But, like, but still, like, it's true. You wouldn't, there'd be no sense of a break for yourselves. And by God, you're human at the end of the day. You kind of do need a break at some stage. Yeah. And, you know, even the two years previous, like, obviously, no one was able to travel and stuff. And people are just craving that um, break away, whether it's a sun holiday or, or just something different. Mm. Um, uh, two and a half years later, after getting married, I still haven't had any means. So uh, these things, uh, can get it put on the back burner and it's nice to know that with that structure you can plan these things because it just means that like the if there's one person in the squad who has something really valuable to add decides not to commit because of that just extra bit of time or the fact that he can't do this so you know all the talk about the people who've walked away in different counties this year and you know they're getting married and you know this that and the other maybe you know the this definite structure allows them uh, to still do those things and give of their best years to their county have you got anywhere in mind for the honeymoon yet <laughs> no, I'll, I'll leave that uh, I'll leave that to the, 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 the boss <laughs> uh, once it's sooner rather than later I'm sure that's probably what she's she's aiming for yeah. um, as regards this Sunday uh, I'd imagine you'll have eyes in the game uh, you'll probably have a little bit of interest in it as well considering you came up against and pushed them right to the limits one of the uh, one of the two combatants how do you see Sunday going? Uh, I think it's it's really hard to call like um, it, it was probably perceived that there was one side of the draw in the semi-finals that was like extremely uh, strong and going to be ahead but I think Galway have kind of been underestimated even the whole way through in terms of the quality they have right across the pitch like big physical strong aggressive team with like absolutely top quality forwards so um, I think probably Kerry will go in deservedly as favourites given that they've been knocking on the door that wee bit longer but I just wouldn't be surprised uh, to see Galway push them all the way so I'll be there watching anyway Um Maybe some of the boys just maybe couldn't face it, but I'd be loving for it and we'll go and enjoy it or try to. Yeah, and all our Gaelic football and off the ball is in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the GA Senior Football Championship. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. Listen, Rory Grogan, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you this evening. I hope you enjoy uh, what's left of the summer for yourself and indeed Sunday as well as best you can. And uh, all the best of luck in the club championship and into next year as well with Armagh. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Jesse. All the best. Gaelic football on Off the Ball with AIB, proud sponsors of the GAA Senior Football Championship.